So about why we change. Let's maybe some common sense knowledge. But I will still talk about it. I will talk about the fundamentals of aquaponics. That might be boring for some of you, but I will still talk about it. And I will talk about why we need the cup aquaponics and why we need a fourth loop. Like we need a lot, obviously. So why do we need change? Around 70% of freshwater resources are put to agriculture. That's far too much. If you just look at the industry, drinking, cooking, domestic usage is just 30%. It's a lot. And we know lots of lots of countries suffer from water stress, water scarcity. So there, we need to change something here. Also, if you look at these numbers, um, this is this is kind of crazy. So if you if you just had a like a delicious you know, steak, one kilo steak, it, it requires fifteen thousand liters, fifteen cubes, bigger than some of your uh, raw systems, huh? The volume, just just of, of of water, just to produce one liter of beef. And if we then look at hydroponic production, it's twenty liters, which is much less. It's a factor of eight hundred. Um, so then, if we take this and we see look at hydro, um, aquaponics depending on how we approach aquaponics, we can even bring this number down. But if you compare it to beef, it's just enough to, to, to grow vegetables and eat vegetables. Fertile land requirements. So, <laughs> we can see actually, actually vegetable doesn't need a lot for one kilo of food. Beef needs like 30, 32, 33 square meter, just per kilo of food. And that's, there I'm talking just about the, the flesh of the bones, etc. And what we see, especially in Brazil and in Indonesia, is that they, that they just destroy the rainforest just to grow soy grains to feed the beef again. And the beef, which takes all our water away and all our, and takes all the space, so turn vegan. That's, that would be the solution, of course, but it could also be a solution to, to find alternative sources of, of meat. Also, we are going to approach the peak phosphorus. So this is the number, like a graph from Cordell et al. It's from 2009. And he actually looks at the rock phosphate resource which are available mainly, I think it was Russia, USA, Morocco, West Sahara, which is kind of Morocco. Um, but of course, there are much more uh, phosphorus uh, resources in the, down in the sea between, between Africa and Brazil. But of course, harvesting them costs much more. See, see the oil, you have, to, you have to dig platforms, you have to get it somehow. So I think when we reach the point 2030, uh, and we have a higher demand and, and phos phosphorus, and then we actually can they actually produce, we have a problem. So they might have to go deep in the sea, and that means that, that the price also goes up. So now let's go to the fundamentals of aquaponics. Let's, let's start with a, with a nice definition. So, I mean, you all know the definition. It's Rakozi says, aquaponics is a combined culture of fish and plants in close root circulating systems. What do you think we can define like that? Who agrees? Just like wave. Who disagrees? <laughs> okay, we should okay. agree with the Rakosu. Okay, why, why do you disagree? No, I just agree with the Rakosu. Okay, I don't who disagrees with Rakosu? Nobody. Really, nobody. Okay. Well, it's not necessarily fish only. Okay, that's, that's okay. That, that so you can use other uh, organisms as well. Yeah, that's, that's something. It's not totally closed. That's, that's, that's for sure, it's not totally closed. So we define it as a integrated quasi-closed quasi loop multi-trophic food production approach. So actually we said that it's fish only. And it's quasi-closed because it's not closed, as, as we can see. Comprise at least a certain resettling agriculture system and a hydroponic unit, at least, so it could be more than that. Not less than 50% of the nutrients provided to the plant should be rust derived. So, um, what we see, for example, happening in other systems to use decoupled systems is that they have to put lots of many fertilizers to the hydroponic part in order to keep the nut nutrient levels up. And they also have to discharge water from the rust in order to keep the levels down. But I'll get to this later. But just keep this definition in mind. One part of a typical hydroponic system is the rust system. So a rust system is usually built like this. You probably all, all know that and gas exchange is used depending on fish species. The hydroponic part, either like this of an FT or the water culture. You could also have the media beds, but uh, they, um, yeah, lots of complications with them, especially when doing it commercially. 
This is, this is a picture of a typical one-loop system. So fresh water gets into the fish production system. You have recirculating water. You have water going to the plants. They take up nutrients. The water goes back to the fish. And the fresh water input is dependent on the air transpiration of the plants, plus the nut nutrient sludge, which you discharge, plus maybe discharge of additional water as well. So here we have discharge. Here we have discharge, but we can't avoid this one. I mean, well, obvious. <laughs> you can, of course, install a cool trip or whatever, or like condensate the water, bring it to the system. Very, very energy demanding, and probably you would have a loss then in some other place. So the advantages of this system is, as I said, the plant cleans the water. If you don't have a lot of discharge compared to other systems, and it's highly resource efficient, at least compared to hydroponics. Disadvantages, a very big one. Suboptimal growth conditions for plants and fish. Who's aware of that? Who isn't? Okay. Um, lower yields compared to standalone hydroponic and aquaculture systems because of the growth conditions. And the fish sludge and feces is not always used. So some, some people use it, others don't. So the reason why we need a couple of aquaponic systems, I just call them DOPS. Um, I would rather refer to them as multi-loop aquaponic systems. So we see here the optimum subsystems condition as uh, we defined two years ago. So tilapia needs a pH of 7 to 9, and lettuce between 5.5 five and, and 6.5. So what do they do, or what do you do with uh, aquaponic systems? What is the pH you run it? Get it. 6.5. 6.5. Yeah. Who runs it differently? Who runs it around 7? 7 ish. 6 ish. What, how do you run? What's your pH? About 6.8. 6.8. Mm -hmm. yeah. 6.5, 6.8, it's, it's observed a lot. Which means the growth um, parameters are, are a bit different. I mean, it's not optimal. Also, regarding the temperature, what's the temperature you use in, in Slovenia? Depends on the season, but yeah, we have to, actually, for both, we have to keep it below 25. Yeah. So from 20 to 25, depends on the So it's not optimal for tilapia. So no, you have growth vegetation for tilapia. Yeah, we don't. Probably, yeah. also, probably also for lettuce, or yeah. vessel, <laughs> or tomatoes. So you need to find a trade-off, right? Actually not, because we are growing uh, carp and other not for modern fishes, so is that there. Okay, then you, you try to avoid the yeah. trade-off by, yeah, by, yeah. by looking at the species you. Okay, but that's, that's also an option, of course. That's also an option. But if you, for example, want to use, want to use trout, and then you have a good mark for, for vessel, yeah, 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 well. So we, we, we see similar things here again. Plus the nitrogen concentration. So I just want to stress these numbers. I mean, if you want to, if you want to farm tilapia, I mean, uh, this is just like um, some data found in one paper that they said it was growth um, retardation when, when the levels were around uh, 100 to 200 um, ppm of nitrate. But um, I know in Berlin, Henrik Munzei has done, he's an experiment there. He showed like up to 1,000, it, it, it's all right, but it also depends, I think. So some people see this, others see others. But I think this, this is a good number, actually, to, to refer to um, <coughs> regarding optimum growth conditions. And then if we look at the lettuce, we just want to farm tilapia with lettuce, okay? Or trout with lettuce. But still, if we, if we look at the lettuce, it needs very high concentrations in order to grow, have optimum growth conditions. So this is just a, a general uh, nutrient flow, which we have in multi-loop systems. And here, I, I made a graphic for a multi-loop system. So fresh water goes into the rust, okay? We have one-way flow to the plants. The one-way flow is dependent on the evapotranspiration minus the flow via the such recycling unit. You can all follow me so far, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, if there's something clear, just, just wave and say, hey, uh, I don't understand. So which means the flow from RUS to the hydroponics is crop-specific evapotranspiration related. Totally dependent on that. So just imagine we put feet in here 
and we have error transpiration here. This rate cannot be high enough in order to get these water levels low and the water levels or like the nutrient levels in the, hydro in the hydroponic part cannot be as high as they're supposed to be um, because this water from the high rust uh, nutrient um, levels is diluted in here. So we have to add nutrients, lots of nutrients. Like a model is like 80-90% or even more, you have to add lots of nutrients. So, which means that the, um, that the original Ross um, nutrients in here is, is very limited. Plus, we also, we also added a, a such recycling unit so we can remineralize the sludge to a very high degree, especially uh, phosphorus. So that's very important because 60% of, of the phosphorus you add to the system end up in feces, the sludge. And it's just, just put away, you know. So what do we achieve here? We, are, we achieve optimal conditions for fish and plants. We remineralize, we create additional fertilizers for the plant, plus they get, they get some ammonia, they love it. Um, we have the main water loss is yearly air transpiration. And yeah, we save water, we save nutrients, and we produce energy. Because, for example, anaerobic reactors, we can produce biogas, and we can put in the CHP and create electricity and heat. So as we will look into modeling mid later, I want to show you some flowcharts. So what you have to think of when you when you add stuff to like in this case water to your system. So you fill up this is fill up water, rainwater, tap water, whatever. It comes to the system, goes to the fish, the sludge, tree sludge ends up at waste, fish fillet, edible parts, over transpiration. So when you think of systems, you always have to think in, in flow charts first. Where do things go? Where do they drive from? Etc. So this is an example for the water flow chart. I have the same for the nutrients. So you feed the fish, some gets diluted into water, gets to the plants right away, some get to the sludge, get processed. And again here, the sludge can either end up as waste as waste sludge, discharge sludge, or it's diluted in the water, which then goes to the plants. This is all for decoupled systems. And of course, the uptake for the fish, and then you have the fish relate. So this is another flow chart when, when we talk about when we talk about decoupled systems. So, what did we actually see? So I'm like I'm like saying, okay, look, multiple systems is the shit. Like this is the way to go. Um, so when we get first the idea, we're like, okay, that isn't really true. Does it really add to, to, to aquaponics? I mean, we, we had some numbers already that said, like, okay, aquaponics can almost get a similar yield than hydroponics. Does it actually make sense to, to add all this technique to a system in order to achieve, achieve what? So we did some experiments with Aeroflow. These are, these are the small uh, hydroponic systems. With a with a bucket at the end, and we got the water right from the right from the rust. There's like a rust sump here. We pumped it up, and we we looked into uh, nutrient concentrations um, for hydroponics. So this is from Resch. He was looking to let let us optimize let us nutrient concentrations. So you can find some some from Jonathan Vo from Resch. There are lots of sources, but Resch is kind of cited a lot, so we we, we trust that source. And we looked into what Rakosi saw in his system. So he has a very high pH, much higher than, than you guys observed or want to have. So we made three nutrient solutions. We made one hydroponics, pure hydroponics, just like rainwater, and we added, we added the, uh, the salts to achieve these values. Then we did one Rokosi, we, we had to dilute the rust water a bit because we had much higher values than Rokosi ever had. So we diluted it, but we got, we got these values, and we made another one, which was rust water based. We took rust water, diluted it, added the salts. So we had two of, of, the, of, the, of these flows, of the NMT systems. They were based on, on rest solution, one based on rust water, the other one based on rainwater, and one was on, uh, based on Rokosi solution. So what we saw was this. So CAP is complement aquaponic system. So it's uh, it's aquaponic system with uh, hydroponic levels. So here we saw 40% more growth in this for lettuce. So that was we were quite excited. So okay, let's do a second trial. I mean we saw similar values. 
So the values are much much lower because it was it was getting dark, it was getting wet. So these, that's why the values are lower. So we saw an increased growth, which we don't know the reason, but we think it's, it might be humic acids, it might be um, plant growth, running rise of bacteria, dissolved organic matter. We don't know, but we, that's what we observed. And we um, then in Blaisberg we did a um, large scale repetition of this experiment, or something we wanted to validate it. So we used uh, rust water, which was full of sodium, was the sodium levels were four times higher than hydroponic, um, in the hydroponic mixing solution, which we compared it to. And we saw also 8% of growth, I think, in wet matter and 25 in dry matter. So now, let's talk about why we need a fourth loop. Now we get into modeling a bit, because you might think, okay, let's just do it. So, um, 2016, um, me and, and, and other scientists, we developed this three loop hydroponic system. As you might know, we, we, we um, who has read this publication by, by chance, someone? Okay, okay. So, so we, we looked, okay, can we actually grow, can we actually grow, um, how much, how much tomatoes or like lettuce can we grow with the phos phosphorus? That's available here, and recycle it, and it goes like here. So we, we just we just looked into this. Um, but what we actually kind of missed to look into was was the was the uh, balance, the nitrogen balance in, in all systems. So to what degree it accumulates here, and to what degree it flows here. So I I ran this model lately, and um, I looked at the values. I was like, ooh, maybe maybe not that good, right? I mean, we we, we see here. Maybe there's an average of 500 ppm of nitrate in the rust system, and here, I think the fish would like that. Oh yeah, yeah. We can we can provide optimum conditions for the plants by adding fertilizer as well because we would have to. But still, the fish would like. It. But for the for the for the plants, it's fine. The values stay around 400. They should be a bit higher to get nutrients. And I mean, like of course, since the flow. Um, it's a very concentrated flow which comes from the rust, the hydroponics, the levels you also maintain at a recent level, but for the fish, it's a drama. So remember this definition? Yeah. So we, we can never like we can never maintain this in case we want to keep the rust levels down because we would have to, to discharge lots of rust water, maybe five percent a day in order to, to maintain low levels. And then we would have to add like eight, nine percent of the nutrients to the hydroponic part and can we call this aquaponics? So currently this issue is dealt with by discharging rust water directly, or being a sludge or both. Um, active denitrification, but then you lose all the value of nitrate. Or, yeah, and that's what they do in at least. And also other parts that add lots of fertilizer to it. So I was thinking about, okay, how, 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 can we, how can we solve this problem? Okay, so we figured out, okay, let's, let's think out of the box. Let's add a desalination device. So actually, we dissolve the the hydroponic solution, or like we don't we dissolve it, and the brine goes back to the hydroponic solution, and the the clean water goes to the rust. And by adding more water here, the flow to the hydroponic increases again. If we have constant flow here, the water the water levels here go down, and here they concentrate. So these are parameters. Which I use. So I first run the run the model based on the rule of thumb, which you all know is like for leafy greens, 40 grams of feet per per square meter. So for well that, I didn't consider realization for this model now. What I couldn't see, okay, it's maybe maybe 28. I think I used 28 square meters, which I used for the for the system. So I first ran this the model once and determined it to be 28. And I set set the water temperature to 29 degrees, 29 and a half. I defined the amount of fish per tank, so they, they reach like, I think it was 50 kilos per cube. I determined the fingling size, the harvest weight which you want to have. I, I said, okay, for, for tilapia, we need to feed proton, 35%. And also I determined some, uh, some hydroponics experiments, which you can see here. Like the total, the total volume, so I'm working with deep water culture. If you have NFT, you have less of a problem with, the, um, yeah, with getting the levels high here. But uh, in deep water culture, you can go that is the best. And I've started the nitrate value with 700, so I assume when I start the system, I add fertilizer to the hydroponic part so that they at least have some fertilization. Because with the, with the total volume of 28 cube, it takes, it takes years until you get the levels you want. 
So, okay, this is um, what Carl Kaysman and I were like looking into for the microphone systems then. So this is what we, what we actually added here. So to the old systems, which you've seen before, the old scheme, we added the desalination technology. You can see rust water flows still to the sump, and here the concentrated solution goes back to the hydroponic sump, and the demineralized water goes to the fish. And this is what the model shows. Okay, very low values of my 50, 60 ppm for the fish. So you can you can grow trout. Trout can yeah, 80 is like the threshold a bit. So you can trot in it. Oh yeah, by the way, we I think is it chairman low. Let me see. Uh, oh no, maybe it could flow to, to, to 80 to 80 liters per hour. Um, yeah, and we have we yeah, have super super uh, nutrient concentrations like for the, for the plants especially for nitrate we see the rest as well so what is the so everybody understands or are there any questions right now because otherwise I have to jump back later yeah yeah the, the desalination device yeah. could you get a bit more specific about what oh there is? there are so many there are so many options you can do electrospay desalination you can do thermal thermal desalination so there are lots of options which are dependent on where you live. For example, if you live in Iceland, you know, they have thermal heat, uh, sufficient thermal heat, they should use these. But if you, for example, live in Norway, where, you have, where, where also electricity is quite cheap, you, you should maybe you look into electrospray. So, um, yeah, but what I assume here, what I assume in the model here, is that from the inflow, 40% is demineralized, it goes to the rust at 60% goes enriched back to the, the hydroponic. So these are numbers I found which, which are realistic. I also have a question. Yeah. yeah. The, um, the model is um, increasing. Um, yeah. The NO2 is increasing. Well, what is the time scale of the... Um, oh, it's days. days. It's days. It's days. It's days. It's days. So we okay. Talk about you have. Right. It's all days. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, we will go to the moon. Well, yeah. yeah this, this, is in, this is like three years. Three so, years, yeah. yeah. But it was minutes, so then it's yeah, four hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. Sorry. It's <laughs> this PPM, yeah. I should have mentioned. Well, yeah, I have mentioned PPM, but these, these are dates. And they're also, they're also season dependent. So I'll also look into the season, into the um, air transpiration, pen and mod type um, equation. So look into this. I think this now runs, I think this one runs in the media actually. So just that you know, this is like an immediate system. Yes. What about the dissemination technology? Yeah. Have you maybe considered other options like reverse osmosis or? Yeah, reverse yeah. osmosis <coughs> needs, needs more work. More work? Okay. Yes. Yes. But this is what Fernando used in, in Brie, Spain. Oh. He used reverse osmosis. Okay, impact. Lots of impacts. I, I don't know if you, if you want to go through it, but I, I just will. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, aquaponics, as we know, puts the consciousness in food. And especially. Um, now, when there's like lack of food security in lots of countries, just look at uh, East Africa. So maybe if if we introduced the system there earlier, I mean, we could because we're still doing research. But this, I think this could this could um, this could solve the many problems. Um, also, the quality is a bit high because we don't have pesticides. But this is a story you already heard thousands of times. Environmental impact um, right now, how how it's how it's done, like the discharge. <coughs> A lot, a lot, all the sludge. It, it's somewhere it causes eutrophication or it has to be, it has to be um, it treated with water. So you don't want to discharge water unnecessarily. We don't need lots of um, fossil fuels, but of course, I mean, we might need some, but um, much less, much less. Economic impact actually a lot. So um, if you ever thought of it, so we have, we increase local food production. I mean, uh, Okay, you can also, of course, put a 50, 50 acre system, and it's like maybe not that local anymore. Um, but you can, you can, um, if you size the system from five to five to ten uh, thousand square meters, it still can be considered local food production. And uh, yeah, you can, you can ensure highly skilled jobs because people who work on farming systems don't just have to know how to harvest something; they also have to know something about fish, about, about, um, yeah, biocides, etc. So we reduce the need of long-distance food transport. And actually, uh, if you look, if you look at the um, the energy demand for transportation, is actually just like a small fraction of the whole production. But it's still like a small fraction. And local food production is cryo-resilient. This this is actually super important. 
this is important. So if you produce food locally, even if there's a crisis, just imagine there's like another financial crash, and like those big companies go bankrupt, they will not, they will not sort of continue producing food just to feed you. So it's quite resilient wherever, as long as you have access to water. But I mean, even if you live somewhere, let's say Namibia in the desert, <laughs> and you have this this guy here, you know, you can even use seawater, desalinate, and it's the system and continue growing. Um, yeah, it's very water efficient. I showed you. You can with with the uh, with this system, you can save much of the water because the demineral sludge here is highly concentrated. So this is actually the water you lose, and evapotranspiration is also what you lose. But with this technology, you can just add new water. It has possible enhanced growth rates. We saw this for lettuce, leafy greens, for tomatoes. These observations have not been made, at least not for the for the harvest of the of the tomatoes for the for the fruits. So I know they've seen something, maybe something similar. In Ipro, they saw like better magnesium levels in the couple systems. But I also don't know their system set up, so maybe well, I haven't checked it deeply yet. But I also know that in IGP, they have not seen um, the tomatoes, but they, they are on hydroponic levels. So if you consider you can also sell the fish, yeah, economically, anyways, it's more people. Conclusions. OK, one of aquaponics, well, well, huh? So I mean, it works. It's a nice hobby system. You can you can play with it, but in my opinion, that that's it. It makes it makes, however, sense for um, like second or third world countries where you maybe don't have this technology. Maybe you don't cannot apply because you have electricity fallouts like every couple of hours, and then you want to have a, a low tech system. So then you might want to apply that. But here and uh, here in, in Europe. Yeah, there are hydroponic growers who just outgrow us. <laughs> we, we, we have actually no chance with normal hydroponic systems because they just make more kilos. Despite, I think it was Antonio from Great Britain who, who could sell his, uh, I think it was shout for 45 euros per kilo. I mean, like, if, you find, if you find these people who want to, who want to buy it, okay, that makes sense, but usually on a large scale, I don't think so. So multi-loop aquaponic systems have the potential of minimizing water fertil um, yeah, fertilization usage, especially also due to the reactors who can really um, remineralize um, the nutrients to very high degree. I think we assume for phosphorus 90% of the test that's in the literature. We're now analyzing the data to see if it's true. Desalination can be used to balance nutrient concentration and also de desalinize water. Yes. 90% of the phosphorus. Phosphorus, yes. Okay. Mirzian and Israel, I've seen that. So that's, okay. that's a lot, and now we're playing it like the, with it as well. The but the first one or the, the solids as well? In the sludge. Okay. In the sludge. So what, what we saw so far, we, we used a USB and an EGSB. So we used one, one reactor, upflow and such a reactor, with a moderate upflow, then expanded sludge bed reactor, and so with a, with a high upflow. And also high pH, so we saw actually the Outflow from the USB of uh, phos phosphorus was uh, was quite was quite high, but then in the in the higher pH follow up um, reactor, it um, it assimilated with the, with, the, with the calcium in the bottom with the sludge. So then we need to look into solutions um, on how to solve it. But even then, you could you could have with the sludge post treatment maybe an aerobic or whatever. But there, um, yeah, it's it can be quite efficient to to treat the sludge that way. Is with very high HRTs and SRTs, and um, yeah. you can you can recycle big parts of the nutrients actually, or in the sludge. But however, we have a we have a high um, energy consumptions, electric, electric, um, electric or thermal. So, for example, in the medium where you have sun, like every day there's hardly any clouds in most of the areas. So you can you can use uh, thermal desalination, and ice as well. So it's, it's it's of course dependent on the location, but um, even if you have a if you have a small I think it's yeah a small system of let's say five thousand square meters you can you don't have to add that much um, thermal heat in order to, to to run this yeah. When you talk about uh, the desalination unit, you are considering uh, freshwater systems and marine systems, on, and or only freshwater. I'm systems. I'm considering only freshwater systems. Yeah. Because in, uh, in marine systems, uh, I think that uh, using a desalination unit is not possible now. Because we all <coughs> increase, we need more water. You have a flow through system, right? Uh, in, in, yes. a, in a RAS system, 
the water after the salination unit, but I think that can be reused for fish again. I can follow you. In a in a this in a desalination unit, if you use that in a marine system, I think that you you will remove the, all the salt or, or no? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. So, so after after the or the extractive you, unit, yes. you, you can reuse it for fish because no, it's okay, fish. that's true because then you would demineralize it and actually get the salt values down here. So yeah, it's, that's true. It's, it's only a system for fresh water. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And I have another question yeah. that is. Uh, in a system that uh, use uh, more than one extractive unit, what would you recommend? Uh, more than one. More than one extractive unit. For example, uh, if you use a system uh, extractive unit like uh, for particulate organic matter, like polygate, and another one for uh, dissolving inorganic nitrogen, what would you recommend? Uh, different loops or uh, sequential? It depends on your system design. I mean, you can show me, we can think about it, but I can't okay. say it right away. Okay, okay. Let's see, maybe there's more slides. Oh, no. Well, the book's time, the book. Oh, yeah, you're good to mind it. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose what you're saying is that maybe you're coming from an IMTA more. You have to yeah, try we, to, we, you have we, to try to. We are going to work with the marine species. We are going to work with the marine species. But if you work the, if you ask, ask the, reverse the question, is it possible that the freshwater systems could start to look at more different ecological components where you have to try to avoid grazers, filter feeders? Where at the moment we've got it very simple, we've just got plants and we've just got fish, which is the most simple system and easiest. Your system is a little bit more complicated, yes. so apart from being marine, it's also got another trophic level. Yeah, so but so we also, <coughs> I mean, at least that's we have discussions about this internally. For example, it could be that sodium <coughs> accumulates in the hydroponic part, but we saw also in Lazewick with the high sodium levels, the, the lenses took it all off, you know. But it could be like that you use maybe different uh, different plants that like tomatoes need still it still accumulates there. Then you might have another bypass loop or whatever where you could use uh, plants like I know it's called it's like wait, wait to follow. How how we, <laughs> It's like plants which can take up sodium, for example, you, so could, could, you could integrate it or solve problems. Well, you, so you could actually put a have a, theoretically, instead of your mechanical energy consuming desalination part, you could start to think of a biological solution, possibly. How do, uh, well, like, it's, it's like a for yeah. sludge instead of removing well, sludge. Okay. Halophyte, I don't know how salty, how salty is your, your salty? We are, we are going to remove uh, the, uh, all the particulate matter with uh, sand, fil sand filters that uh, the polygates, mm -hmm. and uh, our we expect that after the water pass uh, in these filters, that uh, a sand filter is a, a very efficient. Yeah, so but you also lose stuff. Look, all all the nice <coughs> methane here, and you could harvest. Mm -hmm. You lose all the energy. So why would you want to do that? <laughs> in Israel, Israel, they're in such a system also with a USB, and I think they could. They could cover 20% just with the CHP and the, the methane, 20% of the whole electricity need of the system. Plus, if you, if you think of an efficiency of 30% of electric efficiency, then you get still the, the thermal, the waste heat is another 70%. You know? Where you could grow, where you could like, heat up greenhouse, probably not needed in Israel, but for example here. Or heat up the USB or heat up the rust. So you have lots of, you have losses. You don't want these losses. I mean, of course, it's, 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 a, it's a matter of how simple one do you want to design a system. Because I think USB is not super difficult, but it's also no low tech. You know, if you want to keep it low tech, yeah, you have sand filters. Or <laughs> uh, what Fernando in Spain even does, he uses like warm beds, and uh, then he has underneath the membrane, etc. So the worms remineralize it, and then it goes, then it goes to an osmo osmotic device. Uh, but yeah, there are lots of there are lots of options. I'm just presenting one possible option, which we believe can solve most of the issues we have, most of the drawbacks, because we saw many drawbacks, and uh, we we try to solve them all. But of course, it's it's if you want to solve things, you probably have to also put um, technology into it, and in order to keep these values of hydroponics high and ROS low. I think this is simply necessary. Mm. Otherwise, because who, 
because I, I saw like uh, what was it uh, growing uh, fish and plants happy together I mean like <laughs> I, I doubt that they are like super happy in one loop systems and in multi loop systems where you add lots of fertilizer here discharge here uh, the environment's not happy at all so um, yeah so what's the trade off what what do you go for so what's the question uh, yeah yeah, yeah but talking about losses uh, what about the uh, Losses in the desalination units don't you get rid of not only sodium but also other nutrients in, the, in that process. You do how, how how do you how specific can you identify? I mean, you don't lose them. You just, you, just put them, you just put them back to the sun. You don't use them at all. Don't discharge them. But don't you have the, the way too much salt then? No. So maybe so sodium, but the rest you need. Uh, maybe sodium, yeah. but they are already said that lettuce, for example, they will take it up. And if you use plants, you cannot take them up. Just put a soft loop with plants, you can take them up. Okay, that was my point. Yeah, yeah. you can do that. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to find biological solutions for that. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, you have to discharge all the relevant nutrients. Exactly. That would be a pity. But in life cycle, we didn't see that. I mean, we didn't have to get sodium out of us, high sodium to let us do it all up, and we found it back in the lease. So. I mean, it works for that, but there are always biological solutions to, to do it. In but fact. we don't we don't discharge anything. We just want to concentrate the solution in the sun. In fact, our experience with Salicornia is that it actually grows better at low salinity. I mean, it's adapted to full salinity mm -hmm. and will function there. But the minute you give it maybe fifty, only half salinity, and yeah. it, the growth takes off, it, it loves it. So presumably in your system, your no. salinity is not that yeah, high. Yeah, for lettuce we saw uh, rogue rotation. Yes, that's, that's, no, yeah. no, we have a fact that she's like it. So uh, interesting. Yeah. Not all of them, maybe, but certain yeah. sand only does. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the lettuce experiment in the back bike, um, so was it uh, a clear yield for the lettuce? Or, um, yes, uh, I, 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 can, I can just go. What was your shot before? This, uh, uh, let's say we had similar values like this. Okay, we had four, we had four hydroponics <coughs> and bus-based hydroponics. So I think fifth, around fifty percent of the water from the rust base came from rust. It came from uh, I don't know from what kind of fish. I just forgot. I think, but it was it was high in, it was high in sodium. Of course, we don't have sodium here, but for sodium levels four times higher. I think. Than in the hydroponics. But the, but the C is, is um, okay. Yeah, we had we 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 C around one one five two. Like that's, also. that's okay if it's not um, higher than three uh, for letters, I guess. No, 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 no. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't. So you, so you didn't see any uh, less growth? Less yes, yield? we we did compared to compared to the findings in Belgium. So here we saw forty percent more growth, but in Blaisbeck, actually with a similar approach, but there we did more the. What, what farmers do, we looked at the EC, we filled up, and then we did once a week, did tests, and then we adjusted, adjusted the nutrients. We didn't do it like in Belgium where we went to the lab and analyzed, okay, the okay. nutrients of this and that. Yeah. But the, the values were, were, all, were all statistically similar. But the sodium was significant, um, yeah, statistically significant differently um, in, uh, in the um, hydroponic solution, which was rust based. So that you don't see the data here. No, okay. yeah. uh, it was uh, four to five times more sodium. So we saw that the additional growth was only eight percent, not forty. Mm 